ladies and gentlemen, Mark Victor, attorney for freedom, joins us from here in our home state of Arizona. Mark, thank you so much for joining us today. So many things I could be asking you about. You've been involved in a lot of cases recently here in Arizona of people challenging the shutdowns. Uh, regular Adam versus Demand viewers know that we covered the story of you defending a restaurant owner who got charged because they didn't go out and force their patrons to not eat their takeout on the public patio outside. I mean, there's so much absurdity we could get into in this. I'm, I'm excited to hear you know, what you see on the legal front, but also to give you the chance to share with me and, and, and my audience whatever insight you think is most relevant. So Mark, um, as, as the attorney for freedom first, you know, what, what else do you think our audience should know about, about you, what you do, your law practice and, and how it's relevant to what we're facing today? Well, Hey brother, happy, uh, happy Friday. It's great to be on your show. I've really enjoyed listening to you, uh, rant over the last half an hour. I loved every second of it. And, uh, you know, what really, what really struck me, in the midst of everything you said was the most important thing you said was the gem that was packed in there that I wish you said more and more of that we, you and I together as brothers fighting for freedom, we need to say more of this point here. When you made the point that libertarians are qualitatively different than every other political position for one reason and one reason alone, we stand against aggression and that makes us different, hugely different in every way from everyone else. And we don't need to distinguish the difference between the Republicans and the Democrats, or even we should just say libertarians and non-libertarians. We're the crowd that thinks aggression is wrong. Everybody else doesn't agree with that. They think yeah. aggression is okay and they're arguing about in what areas they should aggress against you i don't want to get involved in that discussion i'm not interested yeah. in whether i'm being aggressed at from the left or aggressed at from the right okay i have some little personal preferences here and there steal less of my money okay that's better than stealing more of my money fine we <laughs> can get into that but if we want to change the world we got to drill home and focus that point that you made, the point that we stand against aggression. And we need yes. to break it down for people because until we win that point, until that point gets across to our fellow brothers and sisters, we're gonna always be victims of aggression, whether we like it or not. So what I would love to do, and this is what I'm trying to do, and and I want to work with you on this, man, because you and I are brothers. We've been fighting the fight for years. We could either get in the in the weeds of these little issues, which are still important issues, right? Like everything you've been talking about on coronavirus, um, it's a big issue. It's a big issue at this moment in time, right? We're going to look back at this probably next year. And what we're going to do is we're going to say, we're going to look at what's called all-cause mortality. We're gonna say, how many dead bodies do we get every year? You know, we get about 3 million dead bodies every year in the United States. How many did we get last year? And you know what we're gonna find? We already know what we're gonna find, right? We're gonna find, wow, we got about the same number of dead bodies that we've always had. That's the 7, number. 000, right, so I've been, I've been pointing this out as, 7,000, like, I, to put it in, uh, you're exactly right. And I've been waiting for the day that we have that irrefutable statistical analysis. And you're right. It might, now you see next year. I hope it's that soon. Uh, but, you yeah, know, at some point you can't hide the data any longer. The, the number that I've been using to put it in perspective for, for my audience is that 7,500 Americans die every single day on average because we have 330 million something people and you go, oh my God, a hundred people. Well, it's not, you just, you have to have that perspective. So Mark, just just for the bigger question though, and, and one of the things that, because you raise this next year, you know, are we, is, how, how long is it gonna take to flatten the curve of tyranny? How long are they gonna be able to use this virus as the excuse? Look, 
whether it's this virus or the next virus or terrorism or the purity of milk or protection of children or <laughs> what these, by the way, have always been the types of arguments, right? When, when you go to law school, you watch and see how they extended the commerce clause on arguments based about the purity of milk and this and that. There's always something to justify initiations of aggression. What I think we need to do is get to the 30,000 foot view. We need to seize this moment in time and say, look, we know that probably next year, we're gonna be able to look at the body count for 2020, right? And we're gonna say, look, it's not any different than 2019 or 2018 or 2017. And soon we'll be on to the next crisis, right? Because the American people have a very short attention span. And I think what we need to do is we need to fine tune our pitch about what you said about libertarians and what makes us qualitatively different. And as you know, and I wanna spend some more time talking with you about this so we can work together and cooperate. But as you know, I'm starting this new movement with a whole bunch of people, you included. Where do I live? You know uh, where hold on, all right, Mark. I want to I want to give you all the time to talk about live and let live and and whatever cases you think are relevant to what's going on right now or anything else you want to promote. But I, I do want to I really do want to get your opinion on 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 something a little more specific, really, with what I asked here in terms of where things are going right now. Because I've I've talked about you know we do the, the the curve we got to flatten the curve and then you see the curve of tyranny right you see the increase in all these government policies you see there oh there's a wave. And it did kind of come down, right? We had a little period of, of sort of relief in some places as lockdowns were lifted. And now we're in the second wave and lockdowns are, are continuing. The mask mandates, they're going up. Governments are having at the state and local level more time to come up with draconian policies like we saw in Hidalgo County, Texas. Now, if you're uh, you know, exposed to someone who might have it, Everybody in your household has to self-quarantine and follow these ridiculous demands. I want I want your opinion based on your understanding of the law and government policy and the cases that you've been dealing with. Where is where is this going now? Like, is it are, are we going to see more crackdowns in the next month? Are the current state of shutdowns and lockdowns and regulations are they going to last till the end of the year? Is it or is this going to taper off? Are we going to see schools reopening? Are legal challenges to these shutdowns going to have some effect, like the kind of great work that you're doing? Like with even these mask mandates, when they say, you know, if you're in, in New York City, in, in public, we're going to fine you $1,000 for not wearing, no, that's DC, excuse me. We're going to fine you $1,000 for not wearing a mask. Can I say, well, I have a medical condition and my doctor said I shouldn't wear a mask, therefore this doesn't apply to me and I can just get out of it? Is there some other, are these even enforceable? Where is this going just in terms of the immediate future in the next few months? Well, I think that the level of tyranny, like the level of taxation, is always gonna be at the level that the market will bear, okay? And at the moment, uh, the market is bearing more tyranny. And the reason the market is bearing more tyranny at the moment is because a significant percentage of the population believes that we are dealing with a very serious crisis, a global pandemic that kills people in huge numbers and this, that, and the next thing. So as long as that's still the belief, then I think that the market that tolerates tyranny will tolerate more tyranny. I don't think this is going to go on forever. I really don't. I think I am not in a crisis over the corona thing at all. I think we're in a moment in time right now. I think that as we've seen virtually everywhere in the world, right? Corona comes, it goes through. There is a real thing called the coronavirus, right? And I don't think we should, I think we need to be very careful. Yeah, you can't say it doesn't exist, but it's a funky off-season flu that's being blown ridiculously out of proportion. Yeah, I think that, look, what we have a real crisis of right now, and we have many other real crises as well, but one of the real crises we're dealing with is a crisis of information, right? Because if you watch CNN, then you believe the sky is falling and, and life may end over the coronavirus at any moment. If you watch Fox, you basically think this is all trumped up BS kind of thing. 
That's not to say that on the next issue, a Fox could be spouting the tyrannical position and CNN could have the freedom position. But what we don't know, and this is a real problem in the world right now as to many different issues, we don't have a set of facts. I mean, I could imagine, and you know, this is why sometimes, and I, I, I hope I don't come off the wrong way sounding like this, but sometimes I really enjoy talking to other lawyers because lawyers know how to use hypotheticals. We don't fight the hypothetical, right? So if I say, well, let's imagine a set of facts. Let's talk about it as a, a thought experiment. Let's imagine there's a real new virus that comes into the world and it's actually very deadly and it's actually very communicable and it's tearing through communities and it's actually killing lots of people. Okay, under those circumstances, we should be able to have a discussion about what should be the proper response to that kind of a circumstance. Now, whether you think that this is what we're dealing with now or not is a different question, but your belief about that affects your position right now is what I'm saying. I mean, just the simple fact about question about are masks effective against the coronavirus? Some people think absolutely the mask, even, a, even a, if I went like this, Adam, if I just went like this, this is effective against the coronavirus. Some people think that, right? And other people think no matter what mask you wear, it's not effective. So until we can get agreement on facts, we can't actually have a discussion about the issue. This is the exact same problem we have on many issues. For example, global warming. Some people think the earth is warming. Some people think it's cooling. Some people think it's caused by this or that. We don't have agreement on the facts. So in order to have an interesting discussion about these issues, you got to use the hypothetical. You have to say, okay, imagine as given facts, this, 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 and this. Now, what would be the proper, we might say, libertarian response to this kind of a situation? So stepping back from that for a moment, I can imagine that the world could have certain emergencies, right? There could be an emergency. Say, you know, a, a comet could strike the earth, creating a gigantic problem causing power outages and food shortages and this and that. Okay, that's an emergency. What should happen in an emergency? We should be able to have a discussion about that. And many of these state constitutions and state statutes try to address this by saying, okay, fine, if there's a real emergency, the governor gets to decide what that emergency is. So the governor has some discretion to say, number one, we got an emergency. And then number two, here's how we deal with that emergency. In a vacuum, you might say this kind of makes sense, right? Because the legislature is the branch that's supposed to make the laws. But if we're in a huge emergency and you can't get a bunch of knuckleheads who are elected to Congress or the state legislatures to get together in a room and have a debate, somebody's got to make decisions. So a lot of these, like for example, in Hawaii, where I actually sued the governor, they, they say 60 days. The governor's got 60 days to figure out how to deal with the emergency. And that makes sense if you think about, okay, two months, the legislature should get together and we're back to the rule of law. What actually happened in Hawaii is the governor got to day 61 and said, well, I'm just going to extend it again. And we keep extending and extending and extending. And, you know, I'm doing later on, I'm going to do a discussion about these particular legal issues. And the only way to stop this stuff from happening is to convince somebody wearing a black robe, right? Somebody wearing a black robe has got to say, yes, I find that this violates the separation of powers doctrine or something like that. And at the moment, courts are not doing that. And the reason they're not doing that is mostly they're citing this case back from 1905, this Jacobson case that comes out of Massachusetts, which is actually a forced vaccination case where the Supreme Court in 1905 said, yes, uh, the government in Massachusetts has the constitutional authority to impose and force vaccinations on people to fight this other, I think it was smallpox at the time, to deal with it. So there's case precedent for that. Now, of course, uh, legal scholars know that because this case happened in 1905, it's pre a major shift we had in 1937 which was the biggest shift in constitutional law decision-making in the history of our country. We probably don't have time to go into it, but something happened in 37 connected to FDR's court packing scheme. 
It's how the New Deal got passed. Our Supreme Court was striking down the New Deal, and then they changed radically how they did business in 37. This is where the court let us down. And they started allowing this stuff. And we still are suffering from that decision in 37. It's one of the reasons that part of this movement, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna propose a new constitutional amendment to basically get us back to the pre-37 days. Because imagine if the courts were acting differently right now. Imagine if we had the right people on the courts and they were saying, look, the governor doesn't have the power on day 61 or they weighed out, and this is really what the court's supposed to be doing. Do we have a real emergency? What's the answer? Okay, so, so, so Mark, I, I, wanna, I wanna go back and kind of ask like two follow-up questions specifically, because what, what your, your answer to, you know, how long will this last being based on public opinion? Like, yeah, the, the limits of tolerance are prescribed by the endurance of the oppressed. Absolutely. Brilliant answer by which to analyze this. But that begs a very important follow-up question. When will that change in the public opinion? And I want to give you an example with my family. I'm going to tell you about my brother. I'm not going to name which one. I have three brothers. I'm not going to single them out by name here. But I, I have one brother who seems to have fallen pretty hard for the propaganda in believing that this virus is a real unique threat. And uh, I'm reminded of the you know, Mark Twain quote, which is which he probably never actually said, which is that it is easier to fool someone than to convince them that they have been fooled. And with my brother, I see even now, like, as I I'm willing to admit that I was fooled, like I genuinely fell for the initial threat reports of what the virus was based on what was it the the princess cruise ship where they yeah. said look we had we had this isolated population and you know three percent of them die therefore it's it's very deadly it's six times as deadly as the flu and like i fell for that you know now with that column that that you shared with from ron paul we see that the best assessment now is that it's only about one third as deadly as the flu i'd like to take some pride in the fact that i'm willing to admit that I'm wrong. I'm open-minded. I'm I'm happy to correct myself and to learn and say, what well, yep, yep, they tricked me. And I'm not gonna, I'm not going to continue to fall for that. But what Mark Twain's quote is really underscoring here is that once people have committed to an idea, even if it's based on lies and they were tricked into that, it's very hard to get them to change their mind. Is that happening? And then I don't know if you want sort of another follow up to this is in those legal challenges that you're a part of. Are we going to be uh, do we have enough of the right people on the bench that we are going to be able to push back in a meaningful way? I don't know. Um, we, you know, what we have now are Republicans and Democrats on the bench. So what that means is we've got everybody on the bench who's willing to initiate force. Uh, some are willing to initiate force against economic liberties, and some are more willing to go against personal liberties. So it depends on what the assault comes uh, comes to, right? I mean, I feel a lot better right now in the Second Amendment area. We're going to get some good extensions of the Heller Doctrine here very soon. There's a case in the Ninth Circuit right now that's being reheard and bonk out of Hawaii, actually, that's going to the Ninth Circuit that I believe is going to extend the Heller Doctrine to outside the home. And so in that regard, I think we, we got the right people on the bench. But if you're talking about things like the drug war, we got the wrong people on the bench. So until we get people on the bench that you described as libertarians okay, earlier. What, what about masks and shutdowns? Do we have the right people on the bench to deal with emergency powers? What I think is gonna happen here is what's happened everywhere in the world, right? This virus, it's a real virus. And, and by the way, I think it's important to say a couple of points here. Number one, there are real viruses in the world and, and there are pandemics that are likely coming that are gonna be far more deadly and more communicable than this one. So we should. the danger here, I think one of the dangers here is that we say, okay, Corona turned out to be nothing. Let's automatically assume that whatever the next one is, is also gonna be nothing. And that might be a big mistake. And I think it is prudent at the beginning, like you did and like I did, 
to step back and say, hey, I don't know what we got here right now. Let's wait and see what the data is before we knee jerk and say everything's BS. Because that's not what the world, that's not the way the world is. There are real threats that, that we're not prepared to deal with right now. We got many of them. And I don't want to get too f sidetracked, but we focus way too little on the real threat, existential threat of nuclear war. We got a bunch of imbeciles right now that have the ability to destroy the world. There's one clown named Donald Trump. He by himself, without the permission of any other person, could destroy every person on the planet. Sorry, that's way too much power. This is our most urgent problem that we need to be focusing on right now. Imagine your house and every building you know about is rigged to explode at any moment when one human being presses a button. And it doesn't have to be Trump. It could be the morons in India or the morons in Pakistan who aren't getting along. So we got a lot of real threats we need to focus on. But I think it's very prudent at the beginning here. And I think a lot of people acted in good faith, not in bad faith. I think a lot of people acted in good faith, thinking that this thing could be a big major killer of human beings. And they imposed some of what we now look back with 2020 hindsight and said, unnecessary, draconian, it needs to stop. The problem here is exactly what you pointed out the inability of people to say, you know what, I'm changing my opinion here. I've been wrong on something and I'm changing my opinion. I'm so glad you said it. We all need to say it more. We need to do better. It's not a crime to say the data I had before, the opinion I had before has to be updated. And now we, we tweak our course into the right direction. So to get more directly to your question, the coronavirus, like all of these um, things we see like flu season. It comes and it goes. It's what happened in New York City. It's what happened in Wuhan, right? It's going to fizzle out. If history is a guide, recent history, we maybe have another month, maybe two, until the death count, until the people who are acting in bad faith, the people who are saying, hey, that motorcycle accident, that was a corona death. By the way, uh, in, to, in order to understand this, you have to understand that hospitals are getting about another $35,000 from the federal government if they can declare that the death was coronavirus related. Now, think of any business that's struggling right now. Take a struggling business like a hospital, which incidentally is struggling as a result of the government running the operation. The government is- right. And, and what, well, when you put it in those terms, I. How can you blame someone for lying to government to get more of their stolen money back? And it's unfortunate that it's where we're set up in this kind of like Chinese finger trap. I'm, I'm sorry, Kung finger trap um, to you, because I want to make sure I use the most racist word possible here to describe this. I know, but they, they we're in a kind of Chinese finger trap situation where in, in the, the more you push, the more trapped you get. Right. So I, I, I want to I want to just. Before we get to, you know, your legal cases and the Live and Let Live project, just to put a little point on this, with my brother, I've been, I've been giving him statistics. I've been showing him the data. And you know what? I, he, just, he just sent me a message. I kind of want to pull this up and see if, okay, yeah. So, okay, yeah. So my brother, he, I, I sent him. Two stories this morning. We have a family political chat. I sent him the story that you sent me, the Ron Paul column, and I sent him the, the Dr. Fauci going to the baseball game with his mask around his chin, and he laughs. My brother actually says, LMAO, laughing my ass off. Is this supposed to be your smoking gun or something? Why do I care about his mask behavior? And I actually, like, so I, I also sent him Ben Swan's piece because Ben Swan did a great examination of the science behind masks and, and show that it's all correlation. There's no causation. The scientific studies show that wearing a mask actually has more negative effects than not wearing a mask. And my brother just dismisses it. And I said, well, why don't you, you know, why don't you look into this? He goes, that's not a credible source. I said, well, I looked into it. I find it more credible than the mainstream. And he's just, I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. Let me confirm my, if you're giving me information that doesn't confirm my biases, I'm not even going to consider it. I'm just going to dismiss it. I'm not even going to look at who it's coming from. If that information 
contradicts the conclusions that I've already come to, I'm not even going to hear it. What would you say to him? What I would say to your brother is I would immediately start using hypotheticals. I would start saying, okay, let's, let's first see if we got common ground, if we had common facts. Imagine the facts are like this and lay out the facts. And then you should be also accommodating to, to accept his facts and say, well, how should the world work if the facts were like this? And how should the world work if the facts are like that? Because since we're not really in a position to get the actual facts, to me, what's more important and more interesting is to say, if these were the facts, how should we progress? If he's got the same kind of what I'll call libertarian outlook as you and you may, this is one of the things that I think is, is a huge problem in the libertarian movement, right? Because we're at each other's throats over differences in the facts. We need to get away from that. We need to say, look, okay, let's figure out are the facts like this or the facts like this. If they're like, I do this with my buddy, Alessandro. He's, uh, he's, he's one of the smartest guys I've ever met. He's an attorney in Roma, one of my very best friends. He's a guy I call brother like you. And uh, we disagree on lots of things, uh, including global warming. And so what we do is we say, okay, imagine the facts are like this and we are in total agreement. Imagine the facts are like this and we're in total agreement. So now we don't need to argue about global warming. We can only try to get to the important facts. I think that's really good. And if you can get to that type of an agreement, then I think there's one fact that probably he'll agree to that you both can agree to, which is the number of bodies, right? How many bodies? That's the one thing I would might say to him at the second stage of this. I might say, well, would you agree if we got the same number of bodies dead this year than we had last year and roughly the same going back to the 50s, that, that the corona thing is not a major problem? Now, he may not agree with that, right? Because there are things one could say. He might say, well, because we're uh, locking down, there are fewer car accidents or something like that. But I think to the contrary, actually, so if you talk to cardiologists like my wife, who will say, look, people are not coming in, or at least weren't for a while, to get checkups, to get their meds changed, to get things like that. And that's the number one cause of death. We would expect an increase as a result of these type lockdowns, not a decrease. But I think we're gonna see overall that the body count is roughly the same, maybe a slight increase. I can live with that. I could say, okay, coronavirus uh, killed some more people this year, but was it worth the gigantic economic destruction and loss of civil liberties and all those types of things. That's the discussion I think we're going to wind up having. And we need to be prepared for this discussion so we can come out of this and on the other side of Corona, more prepared to make the only argument that actually matters, which is what you said earlier in your show, what makes us qualitatively different than every other political position. To me, that's the, that's the, I'm like a broken record, Adam. If you talk to me, you know I only want to talk about one thing. <laughs> I talk about the non-aggression principle, which I now yeah. call the live and let live principle. Because until we can convince more people of that, we're having different discussions, right? That's what we really should be focusing on is people who are fighting for freedom. All right, Mark, perfect segue because like, I love the message. We changed our campaign slogan to live and let live. I love that way of communicating libertarian principles. Why is that phrase so compelling and so powerful for you that you want to create a, a new movement around that idea specifically as opposed to the libertarian party or the existing libertarian you know, organizations and movement that we have today? Well, to be fair, and I want to be very clear about this, I certainly would never do anything to try to harm uh, the libertarian movement. I'm, I'm a libertarian. I've been a libertarian for 30 years, and I love everything about what the libertarians stand Yeah, by, by, by the way, if, if anybody, like, there are a lot of people who come into this movement who are like, I'm a libertarian. I've been here for three weeks. Ah, screw you guys. I'm going back to socialism. And you're like, I don't think you were ever a libertarian to begin with. I think you just found a fun label to try on for a while. Mark Victor is in the opposite category of that unquestionable libertarian credentials, both in his life and in his words, his beliefs throughout the last 30 years. I have seen nothing but hardcore principled libertarianism out of this man. So just 
to make sure that my audience knows where this is coming from. You couldn't get a more credible libertarian than Mark Victor. Yeah, and you know, like you, Adam, we've both been at this a long time. And the, see, the guy you talk about, he was never a libertarian because he never understood the principle. And that's and at the at the end of the day, that's what's wrong with the libertarian movement, right? We start on the safe the issue of I think we should be legal. Okay, well, of course we agree on this, but this is the wrong place to start the discussion, right? Because then if we convince them of that, and usually libertarians will go off in the wrong direction instead of saying, look, the reason I think weed should be legal is because I own this body and that's the end of the discussion. We go off and we talk about other very good arguments, right? Decreases in the crime rate and too many people in prison and black market dangers and all these other really good arguments. But Democrats can make the same arguments that this puts us in the same box as them and fails to get across the one point we need to get across. And so people who have been at it a long time, like me and you, are sitting here and saying, this is such an obvious thing. All we're really saying here is, uh, duh, don't you think we shouldn't hit each other over the head? Don't you think aggression is wrong? We're saying, why hasn't this movement spread like wildfire throughout the world? It should have, and it hasn't. And the reason it hasn't is because we haven't presented it properly. That's the only reason I can think of, because look, the world is filled with reasonable and unreasonable people. The unreasonable people, okay, we can't do anything about them. But I think there's more reasonable people. And when I say reasonable, what I mean is you can reason with them. We can use conversation instead of force. That's really all we're saying. And so we haven't said it right. So I've been scratching my head and saying to myself, how can we reach these people? And because the word libertarian, once, like many other labels, right? Once you hear, once a non-libertarian hears that label, you know their reaction. Oh yeah, I know what those libertarians, they're the losertarians, they don't win the presidential elections, blah, blah, blah. And you're written off, they know everything about you. And in addition to that, I think there are some things that need to be sort of upgraded and updated because the world, we are living in the most exciting time ever to be alive, hands down. Look what's changed here in the last just few hundred years and what's changing in every one or five year increments. It's incredible. Murray Rothbard could never have understood how somebody in China could have done something that could have affected the whole world. And yet this is one of many, many examples right now. We have tons of threats. Just the threat we talked about earlier, India and Pakistan, our literal survival, the survival of every human being on the planet right now is contingent on what a bunch of screwed up people thinking in India and Pakistan, whether they're going to use nukes against each other. We should be more, we should have more to say about it than just being a sitting duck. What we should be able to say is, hey, you guys are violating the non-aggression principle by putting us at a substantial risk of imminent destruction. You're being reckless by the way you're storing them, by the way you're threatening to use them or something along those lines. We got to have some jurisdiction over them. There are people developing artificial intelligence right now. This is a huge threat to the survival of humanity. It's going to happen. It's just a question of when. Same with easy nukes. Every other technology, every other technology has fallen into the hands of bad guys, people who want to initiate force. That's what a bad guy is. We have every reason to think that the technology is coming probably sooner rather than later, that everybody is, who wants a nuke is going to be able to get one. If that was the case today, right now, we'd all be dead. There's no question about that. So until we can come up with a way to convince more people imminently, urgently to accept the non-aggression principle, and this is the sad part of, of life on the planet Earth, whoever has the biggest gun gets to make the rules. And to this point, bad guys have generally had the biggest guns. They impose on us their will. That's the way the world is. Until we can get enough people, so we got the biggest gun. We can say, look guys, here's the way the world is gonna work now. There's this thing called the non-aggression principle and you're gonna comply with it. If you violate it, we're gonna stop you from violating it. 
If you're not violating it, you're going to be left alone. And we have to impose that. We have to make that happen somehow. And I don't feel bad about imposing a rule on other people that says you don't get to use force, fraud, or coercion on other people. I don't feel bad about that. Lots of people disagree with me. Lots of them are my clients. They disagree. They say, no, I want to beat people up. Sorry, you don't get to get your way. We're going to put our rule on you. But the other side is also true. If you're not, if you're wearing a headscarf and you're not bothering anybody, somebody who says that's a crime, sorry, it's not a crime and you need to leave them alone. That should be the rule. You know, moral questions, questions about whether people should wear headscarves, those are moral questions. Those are qualitatively different than legal questions. We have to, look, we can win this argument. If we can't win this argument, our species is doomed. There's the power and technology that we have right now for smaller people to do bigger and bigger damage around the world is only growing. We have to win this argument very quickly. And in order to win it quickly, we got to present it differently. And that's what I'm working on. That's why instead I'm putting the live and let live principle, which means the same as the non-aggression principle. We call it live and let live. It already puts the wind at our back. People love live and let live. There are ways to say it in many other languages around the world right now. So instead of getting the wind in our face when we say we're libertarians, which by the way is virtually a meaningless word outside the United States, we need to get out of our head fighting for a free society. We need to fight for a free world because we're at risk all over the world. So I'm writing a book to this end and I certainly want to meet with you, Adam, as another brother in freedom, because I want you to help me refine the arguments. I want to work together. I want to put our forces together and we need to reach out to the other reasonable people of the world and say, in essence, it's time for us to say aggression is wrong. And we need to do it in a professional way. We need to do it in whatever way is most persuasive to our fellow brothers and sisters. We got to get this done. and We got to get it done quickly. Absolutely. I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing what grows out of this new brand and messaging with Live and Let Live. Now, Mark, we've only got a couple minutes left. I, I, wanna, I, wanna, I would be remiss if I didn't get some practical advice out of you right now. And I, I want to open this up very briefly, at least to the audience for questions. If we have some comments specifically on, on do we do we have any queued up already? Some, one, one, all right, let's one, get it on two, screen, please, Jim. Question for Mark. Can you comment, please, on defunding the police? That's from the second floor. This is one of the dumbest ideas I've heard in a long time. The, the function of the police, the proper function of the police, is to enforce the live and let live principle or the non-aggression principle. There are bad guys in the world, right? They are going to violate the non-aggression principle. I'm a lawyer. I don't want to chase them down. I don't got time to run DNA evidence in this. What we need to do is reform the laws that the police enforce. The problem isn't really with the police. Yes, of course, there are bad apples. There are bad apples everywhere. To the extent no. there are bad apples, we should get them the hell out of policing. Yes, they need uh, more. That, that's a good point. I hadn't really considered this angle because as a libertarian, my knee-jerk response is, yeah, the police work for government and they serve government and they serve politicians. They don't enforce the law. They enforce the laws on the books that politicians have wrote that is illegal as opposed to law based on natural law, respect for individual rights, live and let live. But to say, do I, when, when, even if I as a libertarian say, I totally, I want the police completely defunded, that I would still have to say, well, I then want them reformed in a way that serves the people and still provides the legitimate services. And then I would want them refunded to serve the people. So yeah, you're right. Really, maybe the angle of defunding the police isn't the most helpful in making our point. But Mark, what I, what I want to ask you personally here is, you know, what legal advice do you have that's relevant for, I mean, I by the way, for people who don't know, Mark has some great videos online. If you want some legal advice about how to not talk to cops, how to deal with police interactions, there's he's got tons of good content out there. If you want more from Mark Victor, 
He's easy to find from his website. You do a YouTube search, Mark Victor, you'll find a bunch of great speeches. But Mark, specifically right now, what legal advice do you think is relevant for wearing masks, for opening businesses? Like, do, do I have to worry? You know, if, if I go out and I don't want to wear a mask, am I going to get arrested? Do, do I, should I resist? Um, yeah. If I have a small business, like you I, have helped that restaurant owner, should I, should I ignore these orders and say, come at me? These are all illegal. I can assert myself. What, what new legal advice do we need for what we're facing today? Well, being the attorney for freedom for the last 26 years, you can imagine I get packed with activists, right, on all kinds of things, checkpoints, drug war, people come to my office on all kinds of things. Um, and so the first question I always say to them is, do you want to be an activist? You really got to think about this, right, because there are two roads here. One is I'm going to be an activist. I'm gonna make a point about not wearing masks or I'm gonna thumb my nose at the government and open my business or something along those run, th those that road. The other road is I'm not looking to be an activist. I wanna preserve as much freedom as I have and get through the world and pursue my happiness the best I can. Those are two completely different roads. So if you wanna be an activist, well, then you gotta be very careful, right? Because you don't wanna get yourself into a situation where you get charged with some kind of a major felony that they can actually convict you of and put you in prison. So obviously the ways to get into big trouble there is to use force against the police or something like that. Or, um, you know, there's lots of different ways to get into problems there. If you wanna be an activist, there are ways to do it where you might not get charged with a crime, but there's always a risk. So if you don't wanna be an activist, well then don't be an activist, right? If the rule is, wear a mask or pay a thousand dollar fine, then you decide if you want to pay a thousand dollar fine or wear a mask, you can come in and have me challenge that for you. I'd be happy to do it, but we don't do it for free. I got hard costs like everybody else. And you could imagine, I think I probably get solicited every single day from some freedom activist with a good worthy cause to fight something. And you know, the case that you talked about, the Euro pizza case, I did take that one pro bono. We didn't get paid a dime on it because I, that issue, I just, it was one of the issues we selected at our firm to do it, as we like to say here, for the freedom of it, right? It was a misdemeanor. It wasn't a giant felony that was going to involve hours and hours and hours and a huge trial. Okay, fine. It's a tough time for everyone right now based on what the government has done as a result of the coronavirus. They're not even charging many big cases at the moment. So it's been a big slowdown, even for my business. But so if you want to be an activist, what I would suggest is, why don't you come in and we should talk, okay? I probably will charge you a hundred bucks for an hour. That's as cheap as I ever get. And let's talk about what you want to be an activist for. What are you trying to accomplish? What aggravation are you willing to put up with in your life to get there? And I, I take no position of it. We need activists out there, but people need to go into it with their eyes open. If you don't want to be an activist, then you know what? Sit back and say, this is not a totalitarian police state. Life gets a heck of a lot worse than it is at the moment. We're talking about masks on your face. We're not talking about being in Nazi Germany here. There are many times in history where governments have acted far worse than they are at the moment. Be happy that we're at least where we are. Let's be peaceful activists. Join our live and let live movement. Let's do some things in the and really all that ever matters, Adam, all that ever matters is we just need to get more people. Change never comes from the government. If you're, if you're thinking you're going to get somebody elected or you're going to pass some law or you're going to sponsor some initiative and this is going to bring about a free world, you're mistaken. The American Revolution wasn't voted in. Neither was the Enlightenment. Neither was the Industrial Revolution or any of these big changes in humanity. It's a, it's a revolution in thinking. We need more people. And some examples of this, by the way, were the recent gains we've had in both the drug war and in, say, gay rights, right? This didn't come from government. This came because the people in the world said, you know what, this is stupid, locking people up for having a green plant or worried about boys kissing, who's having sex with who in bed, whether they can get married, this is stupid. And then the politicians, just like predictable sheep, lick their finger and put it up in the air and say, which way is the wind blowing? 
and then they change their positions and things happen. That's the way things change in the world. What we need to focus like a laser beam on is convincing more people about the non-aggression principle. Everything else is going to take care of itself. Well, Mark, as our uh, audience is telling me, we're going to have to let you go because you're making way too much sense here. You're going to trigger the sensors at some point. But, Mark, thank you so much for joining us for your time today. It's been a lot of fun. We got your website up on the screen here. Is there anything else people should know about how to connect with you? That is not my website. I'm not sure what that is, but our website is attorneysforfreedom.com. Is not that sure. what we had up there? No, it says thefreedomline.com. I'm not sure what. No, that no, no, no. You're looking. No, no. You're looking at something else. We got your website on screen. Okay. It's, yeah. No, no we got you. We got you. It's got your picture on it. I want to make sure there's no like spoof. No one's spoofing your website. No, we got you. Uh, is there an email address or something else that you want to say uh, for people to contact you? People can. I'm the easiest lawyer to get a hold of on the planet. You can just go to Mark M A R C at attorneysforfreedom.com. Whether you agree or disagree, let's be big boys and girls. Happy to hear from you either way. I like to have a civilized discussion on the issues because I know I'm on the right side, right? My only position is aggression is wrong, and I, and I feel pretty good about that one. So, brother, thanks for having me on the show. It's been a real pleasure, and let's connect offline. We'll get together soon, and uh, looking forward to it. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Mark.